and then uh, this uh, under under this network uh, the uh, icr central tuber crops research institute then crisp and the national institute of agricultural extension management we are coming to there to organize a, a series of presentations of the editors of different uh, journals which are having a very high impact in the field of extension education and we had one uh, program a uh, few weeks ago by dr val snow uh, by uh, the chief editor of agricultural systems the uh, lcbr journal and as a follow up uh, uh, dr kristen devis uh, she is the editor of uh, in, uh, international uh, journal of agricultural education and extension of taylor francis she consented to be uh, to give a presentation today and uh, on behalf of uh, all um, uh, all the partners uh, and as well as the organizers i welcome all of you for this uh, webinar and then uh, before going into this uh, let me give few uh, uh, instructions uh, kindly switch off your video uh, uh, because it will help the participants and as well as the presenter to focus on the presentation uh, and then kindly mute your audio as well uh, because otherwise it will create a disturbance in between and the uh, the session will last about uh, 30 to 40 minutes and most of the questions are already sent to uh, dr kristin and uh, she will be addressing those things uh, in her presentation and if you have any more questions please put uh, uh, in the chat uh, maybe at the probably you can uh, put during the presentation and then at the end we will uh, consolidate if anything is left we will ask dr kristin to answer this question so with this i uh, i ask uh, um uh, dr saravanan raj to say a few words before uh, dr rashid introduces dr kristin yeah good afternoon to all and i welcome uh, christine davis for this uh, session on uh, editor series number 2 and uh, this is the part of our uh, earlier association with taking research and good practices across the country and we are uh, partnering with the ctcri and also crisp and aisa network along with the manage we are taking good practices in research and uh, the part of that uh, network and that initiative we are doing this one how we can make better publications other thing and uh, i welcome all of you for this and uh, thank you very much okay so uh, good morning good morning good afternoon to everybody my task here is to introduce the speaker i am rashid suleiman i work with the center for research on innovation and science policy and also coordinate the agricultural extension in south asia i think many of you know uh, dr christine davis because she has she has been the our first uh, executive secretary of the global forum for rural advisory services gfras and she served gfras in that position for almost 7 years till the end of 2016 christine is a senior research fellow at the international food policy research institute in washington she did her phd uh, on international agricultural extension from the university of florida and she is also currently coding is the kind of a co director of the us aid feed the future the dlac project the developing local and local extension capacity and i think christian took over the the editorship of this journal of agricultural extension journal of agricultural education and extension almost two years uh, back and there is a lot to talk about uh, christian and i had worked with her very closely as a part of the gfra steering committee and also in the editorial board of the journal of agricultural education and extension once again thanks kristin for joining our invitation and it is over to you thanks dr salaman i'm going to uh, try to share my presentation and uh, while i'm doing that um, let me just applaud um, all of you for for this initiative i think it's really a useful thing to to be doing to help your your researchers and especially your young researchers and um it's it's the first time i've i've heard of this so i think it's a really great initiative um that you have um so i'm here to talk to you about the journal of agricultural education and extension competence for rural innovation and transformation So along with myself, um Professor Lawrence Clerks from Wageningen uh, University is also an editor in chief. So we actually have two editors in chief. Um along with a series of editors and I'll tell you I'll walk you through the process of how we assign the editors and then they assign their reviewers and re-review papers, but um We have um currently six additional editors in addition to Professor Clerks and myself. 
We have Kim Dooley from the USA, Alex Kutsaras from Greece, Dr. Julie Ingram from the UK, Professor Nettle uh, from Australia, Dr. Landini uh, from Argentina, and then uh, your own Dr. Rashid Suleiman uh, from India. So these are the editors that, that we currently have, um, and we would like to get on board another uh, one or two, uh, specifically probably from the Africa region, um, and or somebody with a lot of competence in agricultural education. So the journal itself, um, just including some details here for you, and we will share these slides and understand that the session is being recorded as well. We publish five issues a year um, of about five articles per issue. And there's a number of uh, locations where it's abstracted or indexed. The journal itself is owned by Wageningen University and Research, W. WUR, but it's published by the company Taylor and Francis. Um, so some of the information I'll be sharing with you today comes from the Taylor and Francis group and the website, which you can also go to and, and find out more. We just got our publishing report for 2019 and our impact factor has gone up. Um, last year was the first time we got the report of an impact factor. Um, so our impact factor for 2019 was 1.520. And we also had a 19% increase in downloads of the journal. We had 42,000 downloads of different articles in 2019. In Asia region, we also have that data um, makes up 21% of the total downloads um, between 2019 and 2020, some 15,000 or so. So the journal actually started out as the European Journal of Agricultural Education and Extension. So you can see that um, the journal is, is rooted in the European sort of history and context of agricultural education and extension. But it was interesting at a, at a meeting I attended several years ago with Dr. Volker Hoffman, who, who wrote that uh, uh, rural extension manual that many of you have seen, the little red book. And he was talking about how in Europe, Many of the extension chairs and professors are retiring and nobody's replacing them. And he was stating that actually research on extension and extension education has really moved to India for the most part. So I think um, I can clearly see that in, in some of the research that's coming out. Um, but I'm just showing you here that our, our sort of traditions and, and the way the journal operates has been rooted initially in the European um, tradition, but it's currently since 1998 uh, got this tagline on the end, competence for rural innovation and transformation. So over the years, the journals moved from a focus just on agricultural education and extension. It's become more of a forum to publish on agricultural innovation, competence building, entrepreneurship more generally. And we do see um, Submissions coming from all around the world, um, although some regions are, are a little bit underrepresented, for instance, Latin America, which led to a special issue that I'll mention to you later. Now to the aims and scope. So our audience, of course, is experts in agricultural education and extension. And the purpose of the journal is to inform this audience about research on agricultural education, on extension, and our purpose here is to further theoretical development, but also to improve policies, strategies, methods, and practices for agricultural education and extension. So these, these words are important because when you go to publish an article, um, you're gonna wanna think about policies. You're gonna wanna think about the practical aspects of it, as well as the theoretical underpinnings of extension and education. So the, the types of articles that we accept are authoritative, well-referenced and scientific articles in this field, agriculture education, extension, and competence for rural innovation. And because of this profound change that extension has been facing over the decades, um, our focus has been moving broader beyond just extension and education to the wider elements of communication, performance improvement, and really using this multidisciplinary perspective in what we do. So the types of articles that we prefer to receive um, have a lot of scientific rigor and 
and uh, depth, and they're recognized as quality work. They're cited by scholars in the field. So we're looking for empirical research using an appropriate approach and an appropriate type of data. We don't care if it's qualitative or quantitative or mixed methods. What we care about is the quality and the appropriateness of the approach and the data. However, our articles must be embedded in the theoretical literature of agricultural education and extension. This is probably the most common reason for rejection of articles, especially desk rejection, is that people just start talking about their research without thinking of where it fits into the broader theoretical literature and how they are contributing to further that theory within our field. We are also looking for state-of-the-art methods and contributions to the theoretical literature. Another important aspect is that our implications of our study, maybe you've done a study in India or in a small uh, place in one part of the world. That's okay, so long as you think about the international implications. We're not looking for country-specific cases per se, except where they give us clues from that case to the broader theoretical literature. So we do accept um, review papers. I know some of you asked about that. So in addition to the empirical research, we do accept um, sort of literature review um, papers if they contribute to furthering our theory and our profession. So we don't just want a review of what the literature says about a, a certain topic, but we want to gain new thinking and new insights from your review paper. I know several of you asked about qualitative versus quantitative data. Um, as I said, we don't really mind about that. It can be ethnographic. Uh, any type of method is, is uh, okay with us so long as it's a rigorous approach and it's appropriate um, to the method and it contributes to furthering our aims and our scope. <clears throat> Because you also asked about whether the journal is open to publishing country level cases from India. And as I said, we need to have cases that have implications that go beyond just that case. And micro level studies are okay again. Dairy extension papers are okay so long as they're situated in the theoretical literature and they contribute to that theory and they give the international implications. So we don't have a minimum sample size that's not going to affect the decisions. In fact, you know, that's not something we're looking for, um, the bigger the better. That's not what we're looking for at all. As I said, we want methods, we want data that are reliable, that are valid, and that um, are appropriate for the method and for the research questions that you have. Research, or sorry, review papers do not have to be invited, but it's not a bad idea to share your ideas with us to see if that's something that's of interest. I'll talk more about that later. Here's what not to submit. Do not submit straightforward adoption studies. That's old school. Um, there's been a lot of research on that. So unless you're contributing something new to the theory, something new to the methods, we're not looking for simple adoption studies. Um, we get a lot of papers from a certain country in Africa that's always about you know how many men and how many women and what was the demographics, but without saying anything new or interesting for our field. Um, so we're not looking for simple, straightforward adoption studies. We're not looking for studies that are not based in current theoretical frameworks and don't add to the literature. Also, the studies need to be somewhat innovative in terms of methodology, state of the art in terms of either your approach or your findings. It can't just be the same old um, studies that have been done many times over. We don't want studies of relevance to just one country. And so once you have your findings, you need to talk about what that means for the rest of the world. We don't want studies that aren't contributing to practical effectiveness of ag education and extension, and we don't want studies that have no policy relevance. What we do we, is strongly encourage authors to look at existing articles in the journal and, and review earlier work so that you can position your work in line with the, the theoretical debates that are within the journal and within the field as a whole. There's some really excellent articles, um, editorials from my uh, co-editor and chief Lawrence clerks on this subject, which I'll, I'll share with you in a minute. Other questions um, that were asked um, before the 
before we came here today is whether you could publish articles in extension research that are more related to family, health, well-being, other than agriculture. And again, that's, that's fine with us, um, so long as you meet these criteria listed on the slide. <clears throat> Just to show you here the total submissions and also the total submissions um, from India, this is for um, 2018, 2019, and then 2020 to date. Um, so in 2018, we had 11 submissions from India, 11 in 2019, and we've had 14 uh, so far this year. But in total, you can see we're already up to 163 <laughs> submissions for 2020, and we're only halfway through the year. This is a, a you know, sort of impact of getting our impact factor, and so there's a lot more people interested and a lot more people submitting to the journal. And I'm going to tell you what that means for desk rejection in a minute. <clears throat> so our acceptance rate, basically from 2018 through now, year to date, 2020, is a roughly 72%. So we reject about 72% of the articles that are submitted. As you can imagine, we get a lot of articles. Um, it's a big process to go through the review um, and, and get the comments from everybody. Um, but a lot of articles have to be rejected just because we don't have the space and we have to then select the articles that rise to the top and get the best reviews. Let me tell you a little bit about the process. The process of submission, review, and revision. Now let me tell you, it's very, very normal to go through one, two, even more rounds of revision. Nobody gets accepted the first time. So you can expect to have your paper, come back for my major changes, minor changes, and finally get accepted after one or two rounds. But basically, we use this online software called Scholar One. We have an assistant editor, Angela Pacha, who assigns an editor-in-chief, so either Lawrence or myself take over the, the, the manuscript. We do a desk reject if we feel like it's not going to be a, a high-quality article, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. If we feel it's good enough, we assign it to an editor who has the relevant expertise. Is there a problem with the sound, or shall I go on? Madam, I think you need to represent it. I think someone has disturbed it. Sorry? Uh, please present once again, ma'am. That means we have to go back to the same slide. The, the process of submission? Yes, from, from there. OK. So let's restart uh, the process of submission slide, which I think is being shown. Can you share your screen again, Christine? Okay, let me stop sharing and then I'll share it again because it never stopped sharing for me. Okay, are you seeing the slide now? Can you see my slide? Yes, ma'am. Shall I go? Shall I continue? Yeah, please make it a slideshow, ma'am. Complete some full screen. So put it on slideshow. How is it now? No, it is wrong. Put it on slideshow. I'm show sharing the wrong window. Okay, let me let me sh stop sharing and. How's that? Are you seeing my slide now? Yes, ma'am. Please proceed. Go okay. Ahead. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's 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 start this again. I'm I'm showing a slide that is showing the whole process of submission, review, and revision. And as I mentioned earlier, it's quite normal to go through one, two, even more rounds of revision of your manuscript. Nobody gets accepted the first time. 
We use a platform called Scholar One uh, to deal with our manuscripts and editorial uh, review process. We have an assistant editor, Angela Pacha, who assigns either Lawrence and myself uh, the manuscript that's been submitted. And we, uh, she checks for all the, the things that are necessary, that it's you haven't submitted your names by accident, that you've used the structured abstract that we require. There's a number of things she checks. If, if, if there's a problem, she'll send it back to you. She'll then send it to Lawrence and myself, number three. The editor-in-chief will then either desk reject, if it's not seen to be of high quality, or we assign it to one of our six editors with the relevant expertise. There's also a number of um, special issues going on from time to time, so those are usually special editors doing that. I'll talk about that in a minute. The editors are the ones who then assign the reviewers, um, suggested by Scholar One, and we use at least two reviewers. Three is, is even better, um, but it depends uh, on, the, on the paper and, and the editor as well. Then your paper is going to get either accept, uh, minor changes, major changes, or reject recommendation. But that recommendation is made by the editor to myself or Lawrence as the editor-in-chief, and we make the final um, pronouncement on, on the article. Of course, then the authors are usually revising the article, um, and then it goes back into that whole process again where the, the reviewers and the editors look at it again and make another recommendation on the manuscript. So this whole process of peer review um, is basically independent assessment of your research by your peers, by peers who are experts in the field. And the purpose is really to evaluate the manuscript's quality and suitability for publication. So many journals use it as a form of quality control. It's also really a very useful source of feedback and a way to improve your, your paper before publishing. Like many journals, we use a double-blind review, so the reviewers don't know who the author or authors are, and you don't know who the reviewers are. This is believed to give the papers a fairer chance um, and avoid unintended bias from reviewers who maybe know the seniority, the name, the gender, nationality of an article. So there's more um, information here on the Taylor and Francis website. As you know, we're in a crazy time right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, and we know this is influencing our authors, our reviewers, our editors-in-chief and our editors, and Taylor and Francis, and we recognize that there's a lot of disruption going on. Um, many people are behind. Um, things are not quite um, up to snuff in terms of our work life and even our home life um, due to the pandemic. So there is difficulty in meeting deadlines. The journal is still acting as if those same deadlines are existing as pre-pandemic, and the systems will continue to remind you, but you can always let the office know if you need more time um, for revisions or reviews or whatever. Basically, in terms of the nuts and bolts, the how uh, to do a submission, JAEE uses a structured abstract, which is a bit different from many journals, um, but this structures your abstract according to these different headings and you need to cover all of these when you submit a paper. This plus the cover letter are really critical for the initial screening of papers by the editor-in-chief and editors. So you'll talk about the purpose of the research, the approach, your findings, practical implications, theoretical implications, what's original, what's innovative, what's the value added of your paper, keywords, and then type of paper. Is it empirical research? Is it a review article? We also do book reviews, although that's not very common <clears throat> anymore. You can download a Word template for the JAEE, and you can reference um, the Chicago author date style. That's also linked in this um, PowerPoint here so that you can look it up and follow that style. We have a, a submission um, maximum of 8,000 words, but typically we're under our, our, our limit with Taylor and Francis, and so if you go a bit over that, it's also okay. So when you're actually writing the manuscript after the, the structured abstract, you're going to have an outline that looks something like this. You have 
a title page. Um, this should be descriptive. It should include um, the country if it's relevant. <clears throat> there was a question earlier about how to write catchy titles, and I think that's an important one. Um, Actually, you can see a lot of our titles are rather rather boring, but at least they're descriptive. But a few words of, of, of wisdom maybe from looking through the journal itself is, is not to make the titles too long. Less is more, but you do want to include the, the main details. It's nice to make a play on words, but that's sometimes difficult to do. But you want to make it interesting for the reader. You want to catch their attention. You can ask a question like, are volunteer farmers acceptive? Or you can start a new, a new term from best practice to best fit. You can see here um, some of the most read articles that we have. Um, you can see the types of um, titles that people use for their article, factors affecting performance of agricultural extension, evidence from the case of the Netherlands. We often use a colon and then you know a, some additional information that talks about the methods or the findings or the topic in some way or another to go on with the outline after the title page you'll have your structured abstract which is up to 200 words no more than six keywords you have your introduction to the main text and here's where you talk about the theoretical literature that underpins your study don't just start in about you know, your research, but talk about how your research is contributing and, and relying on the theory. You have your materials and methods. You should talk about the reliability and validity of your data and your results, your discussion. In the discussion session is where you really want to discuss what's the practical implications, what's the implications beyond my case for other countries of the world, what are the policy implications, most people focus on the results, but I think the discussion part is really important to talk about what does this mean? How am I contributing to the literature with my research? You'll then have acknowledgments, a declaration of interest statement, your references. You can have appendices if needed. And then your tables and figures um, come at the end of a submitted article. <clears throat> hey, Christine, I so, think you, you can do it. Yeah again do it the same thing you did earlier because somebody yeah. your... okay yeah just just let me know when it stops working okay, okay. are there any questions we want to answer well no i think you'll be answering it <coughs> somebody asked about the kind of uh, the fees yeah, for publishing but I think I'm Feeds, sure yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, I think we're coming to that. Okay, so you should be seeing a slide that says average speed of article submission. Yes, yes. For some reason, um, Taylor and Francis reports the speed from when an article is accepted and goes into the system to when it's actually published. So that's talking about only like 20 days or so, which is way down from, you know, a few years ago when it used to take 80 days um, for this to happen. But looking back, we have an issue coming out next month. So I think this is of more interest to you. So the people who have their articles coming out in September, they submitted anywhere between 10 to 17 months ago. Um, they, they submitted their initial article. Um, of those five articles, three of them were revised twice and two of them were revised once. So these people in, in the 10 months to, to 17 months, they've, revi they've revised their article um, two or three times. So it's obviously a lot of work. It's a little while to, to happen. Okay, so thematic issues are special issues. Um, these come out... Um, as, as the need arises, as people express their interest, sometimes they come out as a result of a conference um, and sometimes just a special thematic issue that's, that's of relevance today. For these to happen, um, they have to, of course, fit the aims and scope of the journal, be of current relevance. The editors in chief approve the initial proposal. And if you have a proposal for a special issue, you can contact us with a proposed title or theme what's the statement, what literature is, is underpinning this, lit, this uh, subject, what's the rationale for why this should be a, a proposed issue, 
who are your guest editors going to be? We don't use our normal editors um, for the special issues. Uh, we normally take guest editors. And then often they have a list of proposed articles with the potential contributors already thought of. Um, sometimes they make a, a call for additional papers or for any papers, but oftentimes it's already thought of ahead of time. But we still go through the whole review process. Once it's approved, we agree on the timeline for submission of papers. The editors send out you know, the instructions and the call. Then they are responsible for peer review process and they forward their recommendations to us through the system, just like any other papers. When you submit to the Scholar One system, though, you take a special, a special issue box when you submit it. Here's some examples of special issues, and I believe Dr. Salaiman was involved in this, this first one on gender inequality and ag extension in 2013. We also had this special issue on Latin America because we felt they were a bit left out of the journal um, back in 2016. The European Seminar on Extension Education, ESEE, -E, has done several special issues. They did one it for 20, in 2019 for the 2017 conference, and they're currently working on one now from the 2019 conference. We also just published early this year a special issue on community resilience, looking at um, you know, disasters and, and things like that with agricultural education and extension. We have several coming out on special uh, projects that are going on uh, within Europe, one on on-farm demonstrations and one on micro ACIS, agricultural knowledge and information systems. Um, these are both going through the process of uh, development at, at the time. So let's talk a bit more about desk rejection, because um, I know this is an important topic um, for many of you, and I know it's, I've had it happen to, my, to me myself. It's not fun to happen, but um, you can often learn from it. So many journals, and especially those with high impact factors, receive far more papers that, than you can publish. You saw those statistics earlier. And especially since 2018, when we got our first uh, impact factor, we've seen a lot more submissions coming in. Therefore, before going through a whole process of getting reviewers and you know, rejecting a paper after the review, we prefer to do a desk rejection um, so that we're only submitting the higher quality papers into our system and, and using our reviewers and editors' time most wisely. Um, but this means rejecting contributions even before they go th through a full peer review. So this is what is known as a desk rejection. And we're going to see more and more of that in the journal. The most common reasons for desk rejection, if you can get on to the Taylor and Francis JAEE site for our journal, you'll find that Lawrence Clerks just wrote an editorial about that in our last issue. Um, the most common reasons for desk rejection are a poorly written article, deficiencies in rigorous application of methods, a narrow geographical focus, articles not being embedded within the broader debates. So they're not thinking about what anybody else did in the field or the other theories that they're depending on. They're not showing the broad theoretical implications in their study. They're just talking about their research, and we don't want that. We want you to situate your research within the broader theoretical frameworks. <clears throat> Another reason for desk rejection, we get a manuscript that maybe has, it's applying proven concepts and methods, it's like maybe a competence need assessment, it's maybe using the theory of planned behavior or technology adoption, but it doesn't offer anything new. There's nothing conceptually new, there's nothing methodologically new. And so we're really looking for an element of novelty um, within the, the, the papers that we're accepting. You can uh, see more about that with uh, the editorial, as I mentioned. There's a couple more slides on this, though. Another reason for desk rejection, we also look at your literature. Is it up to date? Are you citing the most recent um, articles? Um, are you using the current theoretical debates? Are you looking? In our journal and in other journals that publish about agricultural education and extension, are you talking about what other 
researchers have used and found in, in the research. The manuscript also might draw lessons for policy and practice, um, but the theoretical implications are missing, and that needs to be articulated well. So we're really looking for how your study confirms, nuances, contests, contradicts, adjusts, extends previous studies, previous theories, and also presents more generalizable ideas that advance the field. There's some tips on avoiding desk rejection. You can find them here. I'll share these slides with you. Just a little bit more about author support. Uh, Taylor and Francis offer a lot of support uh, through tips, guides, um, podcasts. There's editing services. We do marketing for authors. So they'll send you an anniversary email two weeks later, five weeks later, three months later, six months later, and 12 months after you publish. And they use social media buttons so you can share your articles online and, and talk about your anniversary. Um, but for those of you um, who need some additional support, uh, Taylor and Francis does, op does offer support in um, support for researchers in, in lower middle income countries. There's some free online courses in research writing and proposal writing and it's free to enroll for researchers in developing countries. You can click those links there. Also for the Global South, we have special terms for authors and researchers, so you can get free access um, to articles across subject uh, areas, and you can get vouchers um, to access some of the Taylor and Francis journals for free. There was a question about whether there's concessions for Indian researchers if they go for publications. So you can click on this star, link and find out more about that. There's also a few more um, Taylor and Francis tools to help you access literature because some of your institutions don't have um, subscriptions. Although from what I could tell, the Research for Life um, and the three, you know, the Agora, the Environment and the Development Innovation actually don't include India. I think you guys are too far advanced to get those, those sort of uh, concessions. Um, but it looks like INASP um, does work with um, libraries in the global south to give discounted access to the journals. So you can try to find out through there if you can access some of the journals uh, for free or for a discount. There were some questions about tips on language and writing skills, and I know uh, Dr. Snow talked about this uh, last time. Um, I would encourage you to just read a lot of articles and to follow good examples of articles. Find a colleague who's good at English um, writing and, and editing. Make sure your spelling and your grammar check are, check are on and, and pay attention to them. And then just be aware of some typical um, differences when you're writing for an international audience. I noticed, you know, some people use more or less articles like A and the when they're writing um, or not. Um, from the Indian context. You also want to keep it simple, pay attention to your structure, have a clear message and keep to that message throughout your article. Know what you're saying and then tell the people about it and then summarize it at the end. You can also attend a free course to get uh, help with writing. There's Information here about the authorship, but due to time, I'm going to skip that. Um, but there's rules about who should be an author um, from Taylor and Francis. You can read about that on the website. And then just a few things to be aware of, um, copyright issues, um, citation manipulation is, is something that Taylor and Francis are concerned with. Um, duplication, duplicate submission, you can't submit to more than one journal plagiarism, including self-plagiarism, um, and then any sort of unethical research or things to look out for. You can find more about this on the Taylor and Francis website. There were some questions about plagiarism, and I'm pretty sure all of you know, you know, you could define what plagiarism is, but in essence, is this somebody else's idea? Did somebody else say this? If so, you should cite it. When in doubt, you should reference. Even if you're paraphrasing, you know, putting it in different words, you still need to cite the idea. And don't ever copy word for word unless there's a good reason to put a quote in, a, in an article. If you do copy word for word, you of course have to cite the source as well as the page number and never ever cut and paste. 
um, in anything. JAEE can do a plagiarism check if it's suspected, and in the, in the future, we're going to be doing it automatically with all accepted articles. You do have free plagiarism checks online, and it's actually something useful to do, <laughs> even for your own uh, self-plagiarism, because I've, I've actually had articles you know, highlighted where it's like I was citing myself but not actually referencing myself, and you need to reference, cite yourself if you're using ideas from a previous article and so forth. Uh, the Journal of Agricultural Education and International Agricultural Education and Extension has a paper on ethics of self-plagiarism. <clears throat> Some final tips on getting published. Um, check our aims and scope on the website. Fill the instructions, uh, follow the instructions to authors carefully. And in your cover letter to the editor, specifically say what's special about your article, why is it relevant, what are you contributing that's new and interesting to this field. If you get um, a paper with revisions, come back. You need to respond to the reviewers with a table showing what's their comment, how did you respond, and then re refer to the page number so they can clearly see how you responded to their valuable comments. And then, of course, fill out the structured abstract very closely. I'm going to move on now. I know there's questions from participants. Um, I'm going to start with the ones that we already um, collected through the, the form. Um, I know people asked about the review papers. Um, anybody can submit a review paper, um, but as I said, it's good to check with, with the editors to make sure it's relevant. Now, the payment for publishing or membership subscription. No, you don't have to pay to publish your article in JAEE. Um, it's free to publish. However, if you do want to do open access, there are charges um, that apply, and they're, they're rather steep, although I think you would get a discount um, coming from a developing country. You can check into that. And you don't need to be a, subs uh, a member to publish with JAEE. Another question was asked about similarities and differences between society-owned journals and a publisher-owned journal like the JAEE. The Association for International Agricultural and Extension Education, AIAEE, publishes a journal um, called the JIAEE. So that's managed by an editorial board. And what they do with their editors is they have a three-year cycle where they have an executive editor, a managing editor, and a past editor. And every year they cycle one step up until they become the past editor and then they step down. So that, you know, it's a one-year volunteer position and you're in the editor um, position for three years, um, but you learn a lot as you're doing it. And of course, it's, it's volunteer run. And this journal has decided to become um, completely open access. So if you are looking for articles in the field, you can, you can look into that one as well. The JAEE, as I mentioned, owned by Wageningen, published by Taylor and Francis. We have a board of editors. The editors-in-chief have no term. You know, Martin Mulder ran it for uh, 14 years or so. We do get a lot of support from Taylor and Francis, and there is a small stipend for the assistant editor, but the rest of us are all volunteers with JAEE. There was then a question about predatory journals and whether it's good to cite a paper from them. So it's hard to know what's a predatory journal, but these are some clues that it might be. You've never heard of them. They're looking for you. They're actually begging you to publish with them. That doesn't really happen with most journals. Um, so if people are begging you to publish, I would I ignore them. I get emails like that every day. Um, mostly these journals accept your paper rather fast. There might be no review or very limited review. And then they ask you for payment. Um, and that's why they're called predatory, um, because they're trying to get young researchers um, to, to pay them for, for you know, a quick review. Um, they often accept fake and very low quality papers, they often have fake editors, um, and they really claim high impact um, even if they're a brand new journal. Don't cite them. Um, it's going to lower the standards of our profession and our field, um, and it's, it, it's not useful citing from such a journal. A few more um, questions before I turn it uh, back to our organizers. Um, you asked about new trends, new methods. Um, 
I think things keep going around and coming around. There's some things that are new and there's some things that are, that are recycled. Certainly digitization, non-contact extension and extension and disasters are all very hot now because of COVID, um, but also issues like inclusion, how do we reach women, how do we reach youth, how do we sustain extension services through private sector extension are all hot topics. Both old and new methods, randomized controlled trials is being used more and more, um, quasi-experimental methods. <coughs> Excuse me. Social network analysis is a really interesting um, sort of approach to use um, because extension is such a social field. Action research, it's not new, um, but I think it's very, very useful because it's, it's something that's very practical and will be taken up by people because it's being used as you're doing it. And then systems research is, is quite interesting as well to currently. And then there's a question about impact factor. Um, extension journals often don't have an impact factor. We were very pleased when JAEE got one because we're a very limited field. It's, it's not a very big field. It's not like agricultural economics or, or something like that. It's, it's quite a, a narrow field, and so it's hard to get a lot of citations um, that give you the impact factor. You can find more information on this slide. There was also a question about generalizability, um, which is essentially external validity. Um, and it's, it's sometimes tough with qualitative literature to get that. Um, but you can think about this issue of transferability. How can your results be applied to other situations? Through using rich, thick description, maximum variation in the sample size. And I actually forgot to cite this slide, but I'll, I'll share you the, the qualitative uh, methods book that I, that I use um, for this. With quantitative methods, of course, you want a large sample size or you want to use experimental methods to be able to generalize. <clears throat> Excuse me. Finally, some advice to young researchers. Should you be aiming for high citations or a high impact factor? Should you present in conferences or should you aim to publish in a journal? Well, you should try to do all of the above, um, but certainly um, publishing in a journal with a high impact factor is quite important. And it also depends on what your institution is rewarding you for as well. Publishing in a journal is, of course, um, something that's, that's counted for you know, promotion and, and things like that or getting tenure in the US. Um, but presenting in conferences widens your networks, um, helps you meet new people and hear interesting ideas as well. I would also advise you to find a mentor, form your own peer review group and support group, maybe share your paper with your, with your colleagues before sending it off to a journal, and then consider old metrics, um, which is looking at the quality and quantity of online attention to a research output. Um, so you'll see these, um, the example here on the slide is from the best practice to best fit article that we published in 2009. It sort of gives you a score based on mentions of social media through newspapers, policy blogs, uh, policy documents and blogs and, and so forth. And don't just publish your article and be done with it. Put it on social media, put it on LinkedIn, put it on Facebook and, and, and Twitter and, and other places like that. Um, with our journal, you can sign up to get alerts. You can also join, we have a special LinkedIn group, uh, which you can link from here. And you can follow the journal on Twitter, as well as Taylor and Francis can give you alerts and information as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you and, and turn back uh, to the organizers. And uh, sorry if we've taken up too much time. Thanks. Thanks. Christine, I think it has been a very useful kind of a session. I think you answered probably many of the questions. I think almost all the questions posed by the participants in the, in the, in the registration form. But still, we are seeing a few small questions in the chat, maybe for the, because we don't have too much time now left. Maybe I, I let me uh, make a mention of those questions now. One is, one question is, uh, why we are why we should be paying for an article to make it open access so that is one question that has come the other question is is there any kind of a software for plagiarism checking 
And the third question which I have seen is, is there a best time for submission? <laughs> like an off season <laughs> so that you have a better chance of submission because there are not enough there are not many people submitting a, a paper i think these are the three questions which i picked from the chat maybe sidiram and i am sure you are also looking at it maybe after you answer these questions maybe we'll go to the next set of questions okay yes thanks thanks very much um i'll answer i'll try to answer these um while we look for the rest as well um, yeah, why do you have to pay to make an article open access? It seems a bit of a contradiction in terms, um, but I think it's to do with, with the business model. Um, the business model of, a, a, you know, a, a company who's publishing um, because they get, um, they get financial payments from libraries and other institutions to subscribe. And so if they're going to make everything open access, you know, they need to sort of cover their costs that way. Um, so a journal like JIAEE -E could, you know, quickly decide to become open access um, because they don't have that mo that same model. All you have to do, um, there's there's free online uh, plagiarism uh, software. I mean, just go to Google and, and, and say free online plagiarism checks and you'll find a lot. I, I do it frequently. I, I check um, some articles that I'm that I'm getting, not for the journal, but for other um, of my work. I, I check if people are actually just recycling somebody else's work instead of doing their own work. Um, so those are available online. I think you know the ones that are used by Taylor and Francis and others are of course much more sophisticated, but um, I'm sure you pay for that sort of software. And then the best time for submission, that's a very good question because I haven't looked at, at trends over, over you know, different months of the year, but just be aware that people like uh, Lawrence and many of the, the other editors are on vacation around August um, in the Northern Hemisphere. And then people like me and maybe Ruth Nettle are on vacation around December in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, but other than that, I don't, I don't see a trend, you know, with regard to academic year cycles or anything like that. I think the best thing is, is to get your paper um, up to snuff and then make sure you have that cover letter to the editor, which, you know, makes it sound really enticing to us. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, Sidraman. Do you have any other questions which you have spotted? Sidraman, you are muted. Okay, can we submit the case study in your journal? Yes, you can submit case studies. Um, all types of research are welcome, provided it's uh, an appropriate method um, for the research questions that you have, provided that it's high quality and rigorous. You don't have to be um, quantitative to be rigorous. Qualitative um, approaches have to be just as rigorous, and there's ways for um, ensuring that. So you can submit case studies provided they have that rigor, and provided it's based in the theoretical literature, and provided you're giving the international implications. So maybe you have a case in India, but what does it mean for people in Africa, Asia, Europe, etc.? Dr. Rashid, are you seeing something? No, I'm seeing uh, something like no. In the higher statistical analysis is a criteria for submission or maybe for acceptance. No, we we are not an econometric uh, journal. We're not looking for sophisticated uh, methods. That's okay if you have sophisticated methods, but oftentimes you would want to submit uh, an article using high-level, you know, econometric methods to. Um, I don't know, agricultural systems or a, an econometrics journal or, or something else. We're really interested in furthering the theory of agricultural education and extension in our journal. Okay. I think there is a question which I'm not sure because you know, it suggests, will the journal suggest somebody, a person to present a paper in a bigger conference if somebody wants to submit the paper in the journal? If I'm not very sure. Normally, we do, normally we don't ask people to submit in a present in a conference as a first step before you present uh -huh. you submit in a journal. 
Actually, that's quite common um, that you you have a paper, you present it at the conference, you get feedback from your peers, and then you submit it to a journal. Um, so if you can do that, um, I would do that you know, prior to submission. It helps to get additional feedback. And that's also the model we've used with the ESEE special issues. They've presented at the ESEE conference, and now they're submitting to the journal. Okay, but it's not a precondition in the sense that is the. No, it's, it's not a precondition. No. Okay. Okay. Sidraman, is there anything uh, uh, important thing? Uh, there is a question about like a. Uh, uh, what about the e-learning studies uh, using the technology acceptance model? Probably like Dr. Christian has already answered this question in your presentation. Okay, there is a question on <laughs> English language editing and how to fee of professional editing services which is not affordable to many researchers you know, in the cloud. So what is the way out for that? <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's tough. Um, as I said, the, I think, you know, there's several approaches you can take. You can read a lot of articles yourselves. You can find your own peers or, or people within your networks that are maybe good at that. Um, so I, I think it's not necessarily necessary to pay the journal themselves for professional services, but you can probably find a, a cheaper model and a equally quality model, um, probably in your local context, I would say. OK. Actually, there's a request that we, the particip to the participants to give your feedback in the, on the session by filling up a form. Actually, the link is already provided in the chat. I'm not seeing any other kind of a questions. But maybe because I think you have actually answered most of the questions in the, the the presentation itself is a few to have raised this kind of question. And I'm looking at the time, so I think uh, we are almost, no, it's at 3 o'clock now. We have a good one hour session. Maybe I think we should close the session. Sidraman, do you have any final words to say before I close it formally? Yeah, it's a very good presentation. I am seeing a lot of uh, even feedback also. There's a good feedback. Um, yeah, you can go ahead with the closure. Okay. So, Christine, I think I formally thank on behalf of the participants, of, one for the participants and other for the organizers, you know, the ICR, CTCRI, uh, Manage and Chris Pesa. We have been working together for the last you know, few years in terms of strengthening research and capacity for evaluation. And I think I'm seeing Mahesh Chandar is there, one of our yeah. strong supporters <laughs> for the India Indian Extension and Network site. So, I think on behalf of all of us, we would like to thank you for agreeing to our request and presenting a kind of a very detailed uh, presentation of how the whole journal works, which is a mystery for many of the young researchers mm. and students because nobody knows how basically, you know, what happens to the paper after you submit the paper. I think so it is a very, we provide a lot of very useful insights. We took time to help us in doing it. And I know you are very busy and you know, sharing this kind of a time is you now your precious time with us. And thank you very much. And we will be sharing your presentation and recording talking to all the participants and we will also share with you. And this will be also available in the ESA uh, network page on the on the okay. website. So thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thanks to all of you. Bye.